Welcome to Coffee with Climate Scientists from the Climate Impacts Research Centre in Northern Sweden. And uh, Gerard, you are a postdoc researcher at Umeå University, and you're also one of the lead authors on a paper published in Nature Geoscience this week, which was titled Global Carbon Dioxide Efflux from Rivers Enhanced by High Nocturnal Emissions. So this had a look at changes in the amount of carbon dioxide emitted from running water, so streams and rivers, at different times of the day all around the world. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So, okay, well, welcome to Coffee with Climate Scientists. The first question I'm afraid has to be, what's in your mug? Uh, there used to be coffee. Oh. Just black coffee, but it was getting cold, so I, I already drank it. Okay, so it's empty, empty mugs of climate scientists, no worries. Um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> Let's get let's have a little look at the science then. So um, starting with the very basics, how do streams and rivers emit carbon dioxide in the first place? So streams streams receive a lot of materials from land, like all like all the water that like falls into the land ends up in the streams. And with that, they also carry a lot of branches and leaves and also dissolved organic matter that ends up in the streams. And streams, because they can be quite turbulent with a lot of waves and riffles, they can, yeah, all the gas that was dissolved in the water can easily go out in the atmosphere. So they can either emit CO2 that comes from land that is dissolved in the water or in streams, there's also a lot of metabolic uh, activity, a lot of respiration, a lot of microorganisms that can respire organic matter, like we and you and me respire food. I own the food we eat and we respire CO2, the same happens with the microorganisms. And then all that CO2 can be produced in the stream and also emitted to the atmosphere. And streams and rivers, even though they are very, very small in the landscape and you can barely see them, they emit uh, a really large amount of CO2 compared to the rest of the ecosystems. So previously, um, a lot of river samples have been taken during the day um, by researchers obviously out on their field work. Um, so a lot of the data that we've been looking at um, to kind of have a look at, at exactly, as you said, how much uh, carbon dioxide we can estimate are coming from rivers and streams is all based on data that's been taken during the daytime but actually your paper is looking a little bit different at um, how much this actually changes overnight as well because we've now got automatic sensors haven't we that we can leave mm -hmm. in the water so we can actually get a much better picture of how this changes over a 24-hour period so can you tell us a little bit more about this study and, and what it was that you found out yeah so basically we I mean in my PhD and for the past maybe not even for the last decade or even less, we, we start to have sensors that we can measure CO2 continuously, and then we can deploy them and leave them for long periods of time in streams, and then we can measure things more continuously. And before that, I mean, we knew that all monitoring systems and everyone doing manual field work, I mean, you, you often go during the day, you don't care too much about going in the middle of the night to measure things. Uh, of course, we knew that, that those processes could happen, CO2 concentrations might be higher, but all current estimates of CO2 fluxes from streams and rivers and also lakes and, and, and et cetera, they, they are always based in monitoring programs that, that measure those variables and then they can do an estimate based on those values. And they don't think too much about if there's a bias of day versus night. And then we thought, okay, we could try to quantify this bias and we, we use the CO2, we use the sensors that could measure CO2 continuously. And with that, we'd like to estimate if there's actually a, a strong bias of day versus night, and if CO2 concentrations at night are higher than day. So yeah, it was me and Luis, he was a postdoc also at Umeå University, and we we collected a lot of data, we, all the data we could find, We call, yeah, and we com compiled different data sets, also asked other people who had unpublished data, and together with a big team of more than 20 authors, we put this together and then we, we tried to analyze it. And yes, we find that in night concentrations are almost always higher than day of CO2, and therefore the fluxes are also higher. So why is that? What causes there to be a um, higher concentration of CO2 released at night than during the day? Yeah, so during the day we have a lot of algae as well. Mm. That can, yeah, algae is like trees in the water, so the trees they uptake CO2, and that's CO2. So then they, they decrease the concentration in the water. So that we think is the main driver. There could be other explanations, but I think what, given our in our study, we, we think it's the most plausible explanation. So now that we know that um, running water will release more carbon emissions, as it were, overnight, what does mm -hmm. this understanding 
what, what is that going to do for our kind of global climate models and our understanding of what's going on and, and how to predict the future? Yeah, I mean, it, it, this is one small piece in, I mean, our current estimates of CO2 fluxes from streams and rivers, they are still really bad. Mm. CO2 not, doesn't only vary on time from day to night, but it also varies a lot over space. That's also something we have been looking. So current estimates are still quite uncertain and quite there's a lot of uncertainty regarding them. So, but at least with those with with our study, we can at least constrain what will be the bias or, or how, what percentage of the future estimates or the current estimates we should correct by the night increased night fluxes that we find. Um, yeah, it's still yeah. As I said, there's still a lot of work to be done on how to yeah have better estimates before we can deal with. So this is a bit of a next step: how to correct est estimates versus night. So what what is next for your research? Yeah, we are continuing. We are thinking to continue with this data set because in this data set it's it's quite broad with CO two, and also we also have sensors for discharge, for example. So we are thinking to study how discharge can affect CO two over time. So that's another interesting study that we could do. But currently, my postdoc is a bit. It's not so focused on CO two directly, and it involves. It's also it's more working in the, in the Arctic and, and how herbivores in the Arctic affect the landscape and how those, those, those changes in the landscape can propagate into streams. So it's a collaborative effort with some uh, terrestrial ecologists and how to link terrestrial and aquatic systems in the Arctic mediated by herbivores. So it's a bit different working with reindeers and lemmings in the and streams. Cool. I mean, so the obvious question is, how do reindeers and lemmings impact streams? Uh, we we don't know yet, and we <laughs> and we couldn't do fieldwork last summer because of COVID. Mm. We basically we think that uh, lemmings, for example, they use the landscape in a very special. They they like they have they are very active during winter, and in winter they they live in very isolated areas like snow isolated areas. So that's usually the snow beds where, where streams are. So we think that lemmings leave their habitats are way closer to streams than not than the rest of the landscape. So that could be so they could have a bigger effect, even though their effect in the landscape is not that big, it could be proportionally quite strong in close to the stream and riparian areas of the stream networks. And yeah, reindeers, we yeah, we're still thinking a bit how they we think that they really are really bothered by mosquitoes, for example, like humans. Oh, really? And they they probably avoid wet areas and they try to be always in the higher hills. So they probably have different uses of the landscape. So we'll see how how we can try to answer those questions. Well, thank you so much. That was that was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, it was really nice to to speak with you. <laughs>